Yeah, the first, uh, um, our first keynote speaker is Daniel Jimenez, who probably did commercial introduction, but I'm uh, introducing him anyway in case you don't know him. Um, Daniel Jimenez is a professor in the Department of Computer Science and Engineering at Texas A&M University. He was previously assistant and later associate professor in the Department of Computer Science at Rutgers University and professor and chair of the Department of Computer Science at UT San Antonio. Daniel received his PhD in Computer Sciences from UT Austin in 2002. He is interested in characterizing and exploiting the predictability of programs to improve microarchitecture. He pioneered the development of neuro-inspired branch predictors which have been implemented in microprocessors from AMD, Oracle, and Samsung. Daniel designed the neural branch predictor for the Samsung Exynos M1, which is used in the popular Samsung Galaxy S7. He's a senior member of IEEE, an ACM Distinguished Scientist, an NSF Career Award winner, and a member of the HEPC and Micro House of Fame. He was general chair of IEEE HEPCA in 2011, and program chair for HPCA in 2017. <coughs> He's currently the interim chair of IEEE TCCA. So, uh, everyone, please join me and welcome Daniel. Thank you, Lee John, for that introduction. Machine learning, how do we do machine learning better? We've got a lot of work on how do we build better systems, but uh, how do we use AI to build better systems? Um, there's been a lot of work on that, but no, maybe no focused effort like this, like a workshop like this. And to see so many people, and I heard there was like 70 something people registered at this workshop, that makes me feel really good that there's a groundswell of, of enthusiasm for this topic, and, and you all are part of that. Thank you for coming. Um, so, I'm going to talk about how to improve computer systems with machine learning. Uh, and what I'm really going to do is talk about some work I've done uh, and work other people have done uh, and just kind of try to give you an idea of what's going on in this area or what, what, what I see going on in this area. Uh, computer <coughs> systems, I include architecture, microarchitecture, programming languages, compilers, runtime, operating systems, uh, and these sorts of things. Uh, uh, AI and machine learning have been applied uh, to improving these kinds of systems. Uh, and what I mean by machine learning, uh, it's, I, I try to have a very broad definition of machine learning, using data to build a model of some aspect of the system when it's applied to, to systems. Uh, and using that model to improve the system that could be offline or online. I'm, uh, you'll see me looking at the screen because I'm, I'm losing the ability to, to see small letters in, in my laptop. The letters are too small. Many areas have been explored in uh, machine learning for, for improving computer systems. Uh, people have applied machine learning to cache partitioning, memory controllers, branch prediction, prefetchers, voltage scaling, predicting path profiles, um, improving GPU throughput, resource management, microprocessor design as a whole. Does this have genetic algorithm that builds a microprocessor or something like that? Um, code scheduling, code completion, malware detection, etc., etc., etc. Uh, the security folks are doing a lot of stuff with machine learning to try to detect malware and, and uh, deal with the security issues. So in this talk, um, I'm going to start talking about work in static branch prediction, some concrete examples 
of machine learning and computer systems research. Uh, I'll talk about some of my work and some other people's work in dynamic branch prediction, uh, some of my work in cache management, and other work in cache management that other folks have done, and other work in other areas, and then conclude uh, with a slide that hopefully provokes some discussion, especially since I don't have enough slides to fill up an hour, so hopefully we have a nice uh, long discussion. Uh -oh. That's not supposed to happen. How did I do that? So I'll talk some about branch prediction. It's my favorite. I really <coughs> like branch prediction. Where do you have to like branch prediction? Yeah. Okay, you have to like branch prediction. It's awesome. Uh, it's, it's kind of the butt of many jokes <coughs> in computer architecture these days. You know, the, it's canonical reductive paper is a branch predicted paper, branch prediction paper. Branch prediction is a natural problem for machine learning. Um, especially dynamic branch prediction, dynamic conditional branch prediction. We're predicting the outcomes of branches dynamically as they come one by one. Um, dynamic branch prediction, typically the way the problem is cast, it's based on binary inputs with a single output, and we get billions of training pairs. The binary inputs are the branch history. If you're familiar with branch prediction, uh, the history is used uh, as an input to a predictor that gives an output of yes, taken, or no, not taken and you get billions and billions of training pairs. So it's just a, a natural uh, setup to apply uh, machine learning. Static branch prediction is a separate but very related problem. It's uh, how, how do you, uh, maybe at compile time, how do you know which way the branch will go? Or when you first encounter a branch without any idea of the direction of the branch, how do you know which way the branch will go? Um, how do we train, how do we, give the compiler the understanding that it needs uh, to, to do static branch prediction. Uh, with machine learning, we can use a big training corpus of existing programs with profile information and analyze many different features and do a good job of predicting which way a branch is likely to go uh, at runtime, which with the bias of the branch. There's many examples in the literature, especially of dynamic branch prediction, but also of heuristics for doing static branch prediction. So static branch prediction. Now before I get into this paper, um, a good heuristic that has been used a lot for static branch prediction is backwards taken, forwards not taken. Have you heard this in some class maybe? Or, or, yes. So you, um, you come to a branch, if the offset is negative, going backwards, maybe a loop back edge, likely to be taken. If it's a positive offset, maybe the branch is going to be taken. Uh, it's a forward branch, so maybe we're not taking it because it's, it's checking for some exceptional condition and it's unlikely uh, to be triggered at runtime. That's a pretty good heuristic. Um, uh, Tom Ball and Jim Letters came up uh, with a better set of heuristics in a, a famous paper called Branch Prediction for Free. Uh, so they had a few more of uh, those kinds of heuristics and got a pretty good uh, misprediction rate, about 25% misprediction rate for static branch prediction. That's pretty good. Then along came um, Brad Collar and some other folks. And they had this paper called Corpus Based Static Branch Prediction. It was in PLEI in 1995. Um, many of you may not have been born, I don't know. Um, so, bottom line is the state of the art heuristics got 25% misprediction rate. Uh, the, this paper improved it to 20% misprediction rate. That's big in branch prediction. Uh, an improvement like that is is big. If, if, if that was, if you were using that in a processor, that would represent a, a nice improvement in performance. Um, what they did, they used neural networks and a large corpus of programs. They trained, um, they, they, they profiled a big corpus of programs to find out the bias of each branch and whether it's likely to go to be taken or not taken. And then they used features, uh, things like features from the control flow graph near the branch. Uh, things like the opcode, other things like um, are you checking for a null pointer, just, just a, a few features. Fed that into just regular old feed forward neural network training with back propagation, and we're able to uh, to get a neural network to predict branches with 20% misprediction rate. That's way better than the Baumler's heuristics. Uh, then they had a Toplas article in 1997 that uh, expanded on this PLDI paper and also used decision trees. Uh, it turned out decision trees didn't work any better than neural networks, but it was an alternate approach 
and it's, it's good to try other machine learning um, algorithms. Um, so that, was, that was back in 95, and they were just using simple feed forward neural networks. So what would, what would we do today? Well, if, if someone were thinking about doing this today, or maybe two years ago. Well, I was thinking about this a lot when I was a graduate student. Just about, about the time I got into graduate school, and I had this idea, too, to do static branch prediction with neural networks. And then I found this paper, and I said, oh, I, I guess I better find a different dissertation topic. Well, and I did. Um, but we were able to reproduce the results uh, in a, uh, they, they were doing it on a Sunday language, and we, we were doing it on uh, uh, machine independent representation of the program. And we got basically the same results, but you can't publish basically the same results. Today, or a couple years ago, uh, Jason Mars group uh, had this paper called Crystal Ball, Statically Analyzing Runtime Behavior by a Deep Sequence Learning. That was a couple years ago in micro. This was an awesome paper. So they use deep learning, so they actually use uh, some kind of deep neural network uh, to statically identify hot paths on the It's because of this. It's because it wants me to log on to the internet. Well, this will happen frequently, and I'll give you a little pause. And let, so it's a pause to let you think about what I'm saying. Uh, so, they, so path profiling is, is a really interesting problem. What's, what's the hot path through a program? And if, why do we need to know the hot path? Well, we can do a better job of scheduling. There's all kinds of optimizations we can do if we know the hot path through a program. Um, well, how do you find the hot path through a program? Through expensive uh, profiling, you have to have Representative inputs, that's, um, it's really hard to get programmers to do profiling at all, and they have to have good inputs. And, and the, there are good tools for doing path profiling, but they're, they're a little bit painful. Uh, so people often don't do it. So we're really motivated to find out, without uh, profiling, without an input to the program, what might be a hot path for this program. Uh, but since we don't know what the program is going to do at runtime, we have to do a prediction. So they learn from many, many examples of programs how to predict the hot path through a program uh, via uh, deep learning and some a special kind of neural network that I forgot to write down on this slide, so we just will never know what it was. Um, the output of uh, this machine learning, uh, the, the inference uh, stage, is a probable sequence of basic blocks that the compiler can then use to do a better job of scheduling. Um, a recurrent network, so the problem maps well to a recurrent neural network. Um, so they, and they show improvement over state-of-the-art heuristics. Uh, in many instances of machine learning to improve computer systems research, you'll find there's a previous work that used ad hocery, you know, some kind of funny heuristics to, to get something done, quick and dirty, kind of works, and then the next researcher comes along and uses machine learning that does a much better job, uh, and, and maybe as a bonus, does a good job of explaining what it did. If no other works, you don't get that, but at least you get better performance and, and something that uh, can adapt to changing the workload by increasing the training <coughs> So that was a cool paper that came out a ago. And this is what you can do today. If, if Brad Collar were doing the same branch prediction work today, he might be using a deep neural network, and he might be getting much better uh, prediction rates. You can go try this. Maybe uh, you're interested. Uh, go try and reproduce Brad Collar's original work in, in static branch prediction using uh, a modern neural network or other machine learning technique and see if you can improve on that. That would be like, uh, a master's thesis or a chapter in your dissertation. Okay, so let's talk now about dynamic branch prediction is my favorite. Um, so we wrote this paper, uh, Calvin Lin and I wrote this paper back in 2001. Uh, uh, since I have like, tons of time, um, I will digress. We actually wrote this paper in about 1999 submit to ask clause and was rejected. Don't you hate getting, raise your hand if you hate getting paper rejected. I, I hate getting paper, it's, it's okay. Raise your hand if you hate getting paper rejected. Or maybe nobody here has ever gotten a paper rejected. Or submitted. <laughs> so it was rejected from ask clause, um, and we didn't like that, we were, we were unhappy, but we worked on it and made it a whole lot better, and then it was accepted to HPCA. So when you get those rejections, now, this has been on my mind lately. Uh, uh, don't, don't fret. Make your paper better. Uh, and, and sometimes you give valuable feedback on those rejections. And 
goes back in, and then you have a paper. I mean, we got a kind of uh, reduced the amount of area we needed by half, and we improved the accuracy, and so it was a much stronger paper for having been rejected last month. And then, and then we presented in 2001. We proposed using neural learning in the branch predictor, which at the time sounded crazy. Uh, I, I, I didn't realize, I was a student, graduate student, I didn't realize uh, how crazy it was. If I had, I might not have proposed it. Uh, simple perceptrons, individual neurons, um, have pretty good accuracy, it turns out, for conventional branch prediction. We didn't want to use uh, any kind of deep neural network, even a, a simple neural network with any hidden layers at all, because uh, the latency would kill you. You really couldn't uh, get the output in the amount of time you needed to do branch prediction. It has to be done like in a single CPU cycle. Uh, the latency, even with a single neuron, was an issue. Uh, we addressed it in later research in, in a couple of papers that, that I and other, others wrote. Um, I just <coughs> around here somewhere uh, did a, a really uh, a good job of improving accuracy and uh, latency with his OGL predictor. That was it's a perceptron predictor. That's it's, okay. So there's this new. So we did this thing perceptron predictor. Then Tarjan and Scadrin came up with something called a hash perceptron that really reduced uh, the latency and the amount of computation we needed um, by a trick that I won't go into because it's, it's too low level. And then Sesnik did use the same trick and added in geometric histories. So we, we had uh, the, the features were, were much improved for branch prediction. Uh, and Gabriel and I did something similar also. Uh, and then things have evolved in, in neural branch prediction. Uh, if you see uh, Andre's, it's because of this. If you see Andre's uh, Tage SCL predictor, the SC part is a perceptron predictor. Uh, so he, he has his Tage predictor that's a different thing. And then sometimes it's, it's wrong and you can tell when it might be wrong. And the statistical corrector is a perceptron predictor that incorporates many different features uh, and, and corrects the, uh, the wrong page predictor. I'd said a lot of other people have, have done work using perceptron prediction. Now it's in processors that you can go to buy today uh, from AMD, Spark, and, and one that I like in particular from Samsung. Uh, so just, so this, I think I have a slide like this in most of the talks I give on branch prediction. Uh, how does it work? to do branch prediction with a neuron. The X's uh, in this picture here are the inputs, they're the uh, branch history, the recent branch history. So uh, X1 is the, most, the outcome of the most recent branch, taken or not taken, represented as one or negative one. And X2 is the penultimate branch. X3 is the third most recent branch and so forth. And then the one is a bias input that you need for, for perceptrons, if you know about, about perceptrons. Uh, then there's the weights. They're set by online training, by the perceptron training algorithm. Uh, we compute the output, call it Y out, uh, or Y. Uh, it's just the dot product of the uh, vector of inputs and the, the weights. I would use a laser pointer, but, I, but I, I've learned that I, I just go crazy with it and point at everything blind people's so eyes. Uh, and we threshold the output, and if it's uh, at least zero, predict taken. If it's less than zero, predict not taken. That's a branch prediction perceptron. The training algorithm is just perceptron training. Um, the accuracy of a uh, perceptron predictor is affected by uh, this thing called uh, linear separability. Perceptrons can only compute linearly separable functions. Um, so in this cartoon, I have a perceptron on the left learning to predict the AND function. We give many examples of the AND function. And uh, you can think of the, the dark, so the uh, the decision surface um, is like a plane cutting through the third dimension, uh, separating uh, the one um, yes from the three no's, uh, the one true from the three falses. But XOR cannot be learned. Perceptrons can't learn the XOR function uh, because XOR is not linearly separable. It's literally inseparable. Uh, so that was a problem with using this very, very simple machine learning algorithm. It couldn't compute certain functions. Uh, so we addressed this uh, with something called piecewise linear branch prediction, where we used the path leading to the branch to pick out many different perceptrons uh, dynamically and uh, give rise to a piecewise linear decision surface that's much better at learning 
in this case, the XOR function. Perfectly learned the XOR function after a few samples where a perceptron is just 50% uh, accurate. It's no better than random guessing. Uh, uh, so path-based and piecewise linear branch prediction addressed the latency problem. So because of something called a head pipelining, we really reduced the latency of, of the branch prediction. And it turned out that the approach also Health accuracy because it got rid of this linear solvability problem. Uh, current approaches use hashing to achieve much the same effect, uh, overcome nonlinearity in the inputs. Uh, if you have a processor that has a neural branch printer in it, it's probably using a hash per second. Okay, so that's that's branch prediction. Well, I like branch prediction a lot, and we can talk about it all you want if you have questions. Another topic um, that I've done some work on, other people have done, that involves machine learning, cache management. Uh, so people have done a lot of work with uh, placement and replacement and bypass, these are uh, kind of replacement policy optimizations, and people have done a lot of work with, with prefetching as well. We continue to do work with prefetching uh, in machine learning. Uh, so the first thing that I'll present about this is uh, we had a paper in micro 2013 on placement and promotion of pseudo learning caches. Um, so this is a story that I, I, I was very really gratified just to see, at the, I don't know if you like the work or not, but the, the way that it, it came to be uh, was, was something that I uh, uncovered. Uh, the original idea, of, so LRU, the LRU placement policy in cache is kind of a boring policy. Um, you place an incoming block into the LRU position, and then when you touch a block, you promote it to the LRU position. That's boring. Um, what if we had a different promotion policy? There's a lot of different things you could do. Place it somewhere else in the recency stack. When you promote it, don't promote it to MRU. Promote it somewhere else. Where should I promote it? Uh, promote it somewhere maybe based on its current position. If it's all the way at the, at the LRU position and I touch it, that means, oh, well, there's a locality left in this block. Maybe I should promote it to MRU. If it's in the middle, then if, it, you know, if I touch it, maybe if I, let's keep doing this. If, maybe if I move it up just by one position, maybe that's enough to protect it from being evicted next time. Um, but I don't know, what's, what's a good heuristic? I have no idea. Um, it's a normal search space. If I, if, so again, if a block is in a certain position in the LRU stack, uh, if I have to say a 16 way set associated cache, I've got a uh, way that the position zero is uh, MRU, position 15 is LRU, and there's 14 positions in between there. When I touch a block, given its current position, where should I promote it? Uh, is there a, a, an optimal heuristic for, if I'm in position 4, I should go to position 2 or something like that? It's a huge search space. Turns out it's, it's the, the number of, of, for a 16 minute set of social cash, the number of possible different promotion policies is it's astronomical. So I applied genetic algorithms. So I, I used a genetic algorithm where the fitness function was the MPK, the, the, the miss rate, basically, um, on uh, a set of traces, and found uh, a good set, uh, a, a good heuristic, a good uh, way of promoting from a <coughs> position to another position that uh, improved uh, the miss rate. Um, and since I'm, I, in my research, I try to be practical. I, I like to like my research to one day be applied in the industry. So I try not to do crazy things, too, too crazy. Well, first of all, too crazy. Um, so I said, let's apply this to pseudo-LRU caches instead of LRU caches, uh, where if you have tree-based pseudo-LRU, you can have a sort of notion of recency stack that's a little more complicated than regular LRU, but it, but it works. Um, we applied this to pseudo-LRU. We got good performance over um, state-of-the-art static you know, heuristics for doing uh, cash replacement. Um, and, but the thing that bugged people was, what do these heuristics mean? We had the set of heuristics uh, that the genetic algorithm gave us, and we didn't really know why it worked. It was like, and, 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 and you could say, uh, well, this works on this set of workloads, but what about another set of workloads? We did cross-validation to make sure that, that we didn't use the same testing and, and training set, uh, but is a valid criticism, uh, well, overfitting to this kind of workload. Uh, so I went back and I tried harder 
I, I used multi-core workloads. The genetic island takes longer because um, now the traces are much bigger and, 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 and the simulation just takes much longer. But um, I had time and, and computation. Uh, the genetic algorithm found a simple recursive algorithm for placement and promotion uh, that we published uh, a couple years ago in HPCA. Uh, so the first paper, we had this sort of, the, the genetic algorithms gave us a bunch of numbers that we didn't really understand what they meant. We just knew that they gave good performance. And then later on, the genetic algorithm tried harder. I made it try harder, try harder. And it gave us something, uh, it, the same result. Every time I would run the genetic algorithm, Different inputs that were multi-core workloads. It came up. It kept converging to the same course over and over again. That, and I, I looked at it. I said, "What does this mean?" It was a simple recursive algorithm for doing this kind of placement promotion that you could understand. And this is the algorithm. We call it minimal disturbance uh, placement and promotion. Uh, that was my. The student came up with that title. We were trying to sell it with a different name. It kept being rejected. Uh, uh, and so. This is the, I'm not going to go over it too much, but um, is there any animation? Yeah. Was, uh, you divide the pseudo IU tree into protected regions, and there's a, when you read the paper, there's a nice little recursive algorithm that, uh, that's easy to understand that came out of the genetic algorithm. Uh, so when I was first doing the work with the genetic algorithm, before we had this uh, algorithm, uh, I, I Lately, I've, I've, been, I've stopped caring about it if someone's going to steal my work. I just I go and present work that I haven't published yet and just get feedback from people. Uh, and so I, I was given the, the presentation um, on genetic algorithm stuff before it had been accepted to micro. And uh, one of the audience members, uh, Henry Young Pat, uh, he, I, he said, yeah, what does it mean? And I, I, I didn't, I don't know, it's just, this is what the genetic algorithm did. And I said, you know what, maybe, we're, humans are smart, but there's only so far we can go. And we should let the machine try to discover algorithms. And because the machine, uh, it's not necessarily smarter than us, but it, 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 it can it work harder. It can, it can do the tedious tasks. It can. Uh, it might not have <coughs> the insight that we're looking for, but it can do a better job than we can of thinking. I, and I, 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 I said, I think that we're going to have to have the computers designing the computers because we are reaching the limit of what we can do. And Yale strongly disagreed. Uh, uh, he, he thought, no, we're, we're smart and we need my machine to replace me. Uh, and I thought about that. Yeah, I don't know. Uh, that, this is kind of the point of this workshop, isn't it? Our, uh, can a computer do a better job than a computer architect? Can we put ourselves out of a job? Uh, and with this result, uh, maybe maybe it's not that we want them to put us out of a job, but we want them to give us insights. We want them to do the hard work that gives us, uh, that we can we can look at it and understand it and come to new insights based on the hard work that the machines have done. So this algorithm, uh, really, we had we had like two or three co authors two or three authors on the paper. I should have put genetic algorithm as another co author on the paper. Because it really, it's, it's, an, it's an algorithm I can explain to you, I won't, but I can explain to you in like 15 minutes. It makes sense, it's intuitive why it should work. And I would never have thought of it uh, in a million years. Maybe yeah, would have, but I would never have thought of it in a million years uh, unless the genetic algorithm had sort of proposed it to us. And so that, I, that's how I think we can use machine learning as a tool uh, for improving computer systems. Uh, and then there's this animation that my student drew, okay. Um, all right. The next topic uh, that I really like and I've been working on a lot, it's been something that I like to call reuse prediction. Uh, I think the term used this way was invented by Hunter Mutlu in a paper a few years ago. Uh, people have been calling it deadlock prediction, but I think that's a little macabre, so I, I like to call it reuse prediction. That's like there's a, actually a better argument for not saying deadlock prediction, but uh, deadlock prediction is predicting whether a block in the cache will be used again before it's evicted. Uh, I can be used for a variety of optimizations, like placement or replacement. Where should I place the block? Maybe I have an inclusive cache. Uh, I predict this block will be dead. Let's place it in the LIU position so we can get rid of it as soon as possible. Doesn't waste space uh, crawling down the, uh, the LIU stack. Bypass, I say, well, this is not an inclusive cache. So uh, this block 
It's coming in, it's dead, let's just bypass it to the core, not even put it in the cache. Uh, prefetch, where should I place a prefetch block? Uh, how about a block that's predicted to be dead? Uh, etc. turning off uh, the cache line. If the cache line is, is uh, predicted to be dead, well, gate the power to it so that it doesn't waste any energy in, in, the, in the cache. We use perceptron learning to do dead block prediction. I, I, I and others, uh, starting with Baba Falsaf in 2001, have done a ton of work on, on dead block prediction. Um, but we said, let's apply perceptron learning to dead block prediction. So we did. Um, and, and again, reuse prediction sounds nicer. There's, there's no death involved. And, uh, I'm trying to promote that term. So we, in our papers, we call it reuse prediction. So how does perceptron learning for reuse prediction work? Um, so we have multiple features. The features are <coughs> the uh, bits from the program counter of the instruction that's, act that's doing the memory access, and bits from the physical address of the block that's being accessed. Uh, and just different uh, views of, of these bits, different shifts, shiftings of these, these bits. Uh, each feature indexes a different table. Uh, then we compute the y out, that's the sum of counters from the tables. We predict the block is dead if that sum exceeds a certain threshold. Uh, and then we have something called a sampler that provides training data uh, and in an efficient way that, that um, we can read the paper. Uh, and then we use the perceptron learning rule. If, if we have a misprediction, we predict that a block was dead and it wasn't dead, we predict it wasn't dead and it was dead, uh, or if the uh, magnitude of the output is below some threshold beta, uh, then we do perceptron training. We increment uh, counters, uh, if we increment the corresponding counters if uh, the block is dead, we decrement them if the block is not dead. Uh, that's not a perceptron. That's not a weights vector having its dot product taken with an input vector, but it's perceptron learning. It's a vector of weights, each of which has been indexed by a different <coughs> feature, and we're incrementing them or decrementing them based on perceptron learning. Yeah, so that's um, that technique. Uh, this is another chart that shows how the, the thing is organized. Uh, it's, it's practical. It's got six tables. Each one has a small number of entries uh, with six bit weights. Uh, we keep uh, feature vectors per core. Uh, the features are the PC of the <coughs> memory access instruction that we're trying to predict if that access is leading to a dead block or not. The previous PC of any instruction that access memory shifted uh, right by one, with the previous PC to that by two, the previous PC to that by three, and then a couple of different shifts of the tag or the block that were suspected it might be dead. Um, those features, and if you read the paper, there are actually good reasons why we use those features, uh, and it led to pretty good accuracy and, and pretty good performance. I'm going to show you, uh, I, this is my, my love for Violin Plus is, is getting me into trouble because people always ask me, what does it mean, these violin plots? These are violin plots. Have you seen about, where have you seen violin plots before? Okay, where did you was my talk. <laughs> like, um, so it's a rotated 90 degree probability density function uh, of, of some statistic. And it kind of tells you about the distribution, about the, the variance. Uh, how many, oh, come on, that's even worse. Uh, so it, Pointer, so I shouldn't have a later point. So the average is somewhere around here. Uh, the dark blobs are the coverage rate. That's that's uh, uh, over a large set of benchmarks. What percentage of blocks do we predict are dead? And so our our technique has a high coverage rate. Uh, so it, it lends itself to the optimization frequently. But it has a, a narrow variance. Um, so uh, it delivers a consistent coverage rate over, over all the benchmarks, where the other guys um, ship in a static, uh, or what's called sampling based at block prediction that we also uh, invented, they have much higher variances. So you, don't, you can't get a dependable uh, prediction from those techniques. Um, and we have a much lower false positive rate. That's these lighter blobs on the, on the bottom. So we have, with perceptron running, we have about a 3.2% false positive rate versus the other guys that are about double. False positives are the bad predictions that you don't want with dead block prediction. Because if I predict the block is dead, and it isn't dead, and I replace it, then I just caused a cache miss. Uh, so uh, 
but again, mostly this slide is uh, to uh, amortize the effort of producing violin charts of all the talks that I give. Then we, we went to this a little bit further, and uh, this thing I called multi-perspective reuse uh, prediction. Uh, we thought of many different features uh, to adapt to various work, kind of workload behaviors, uh, and gave ourselves a even much bigger search space, and used a genetic algorithm to select features from that search space. And we significantly improved performance over the then state of the art. Uh, and one contribution of that work was the set of parameterized features. So we have features like uh, whether that set, uh, if the last access to that set had been a hit or a miss as a feature. Uh, the bits from the program counter, bits from the physical address, bits from the history of, of program counters. Um, a, a bit that says this is a placement or it's an access to an already placed block. Um, many other features that, that we, we had. We do it at the genetic algorithm and say, genetic algorithm, figure out for me a good set of maybe 16 features uh, with their parameters that, uh, that leads to the, the lowest uh, number of misses over some set of traces. And uh, I don't know how the results here, but we, we had you know, better than this data. We had really good results. We did way better than the perceptron, which I, for the perceptron, I came up with the features. I said, these are going to be good features. Oh, let me try this, let me try that. Here's some good features. For this, we let the genetic algorithm find the features, and it did a much better job. And it came up with stuff that we would not have imagined. Uh, one of the things that uh, that we discovered, or sort of rediscovered, we had already published in, in ASPLOS, but had already but, but rediscovered that uh, just a global counter is a good dead block predictor. Count up when a block is dead, count down when a block isn't dead, and the tendency of blocks uh, recently to be dead is a good dead block predictor. Uh, and so this, the genetic algorithm discovered that on its own. Uh, it, uh, one of the features was the offset into the current block uh, that, that the axis, so the, the lower order bits of, of the, the physical address. Uh, now, it turns out this is sort of correlated to whether a block is dead because it might tell you uh, with, when, when the stars are aligned, it might tell you what field you're accessing in an object. But the genetic algorithm seemed to use this as a sort of random number generator. The, the, and and, and if for, for a different uh, so, so we gave it, we thought, okay, the block offset, you, you'll use it and then it'll, it'll tell you something because it's correlated because it's the block offset, but the deduct algorithm said, no, I want to use it as a random number generator because I want to be able to, uh, to have randomness. And so it used that, it was, it was kind of cool, we just saw the genetic algorithm do that, and it was like, oh, you could do that, we never thought of that, and it helped. So the feature selection project, the, that, so the, using the perceptron learning algorithm, we had done that before, we applied it here again. But then searching this big design space of input features for the perceptron uh, using the genetic, genetic algorithm, that was another contribution. Okay, so then uh, I've done <coughs> my stuff that I've done. Uh, there have been a lot of other, there's been a lot of other work applying machine learning to computer systems research. I'll just go over a couple of more things uh, and then give a, a big list of things and then we can start discussing. Just connect to the internet, then it'll be okay. But I don't know how to do that. Okay, so there's this other paper from SC 2009, machine learning based prefetch optimization for data center applications. They evaluate several several classifiers to predict the best configuration of the four Intel Core 2 hardware prefetchers. Uh, so this is a really cool paper. So you have this, these hardware prefetchers, and you, for a given workload, you don't know which ones should I turn on and turn off. Uh, in, well, you can do trial and error and try to tune your workload, but again, that's like profiling, that's painful, programmers don't want to do it. So could we have the machine uh, predict that itself? So these guys uh, tried all kinds of different machine learning algorithms to try to, to get heuristics for setting the prefetchers uh, based on uh, program features. They tried nearest neighbor, naive bays, decision trees, something called Ripper, which I don't even know what that is, support vector machines, and two different kinds of neural networks. Um, and what they what they achieved was performance within 1% of the optimal configuration. You can try, with four prefetches, you can try all possible combinations and figure out what the optimal one is for each benchmark. And their machine learning uh, idea got within 1% of optimal every time. So that, that was a really nice result. Um, reinforcement learning for, for prefetching. So these guys 
uh, they had this paper called Semantic Locality and Context-Based Prefetching Using Research <coughs> and, and, and three years ago, ISCA. Uh, design a hardware prefetching using reinforcement learning using uh, some machine learning algorithm called Contextual Bandits. That's a generalization of multi arm bandits. Uh, they have this online algorithm that collects history data for learning. It does feature selection online, uh, predicts uh, using current context to generate prefetches, and then updates pictures based on observing the results of those prefetches. Uh, and outperforms SMS, which is the, the prefetch you compare against if you're trying to write a paper for ISCA 2050. Uh, so that was cool. So this is, I think, the first use of uh, machine learning in, in a prefetcher, in a, a Harvard prefetcher. I could be wrong about that. And it won't be the last. There are people working on this. Okay, so let's go through a bunch of other things just, just to give you an idea of some work that has caught my attention. Um, and I know there's just been a lot of work in this area. This is not all of it. Uh, I had a class that I taught a couple years ago uh, where we uh, read a bunch of these papers. And so these are some of the papers that we found interesting in this class. Um, Self-optimizing memory controllers, a reinforcement learning approach, uh, reducing data movement energy and online via online data clustering and encoding, online learning and option alerts for CMP uncore power management. I know this was a that. Um, maximizing maximizing hardware prefetcher effectiveness with machine learning, deep learning strategy on mining block correlations and storage systems. These are all papers where we're applying machine learning somehow to like the prefetching or Systems. Integrated CPU and L2 cache voltage scaling using machine learning. You see the different, many different applications. Phase change memory optimization, optimization for a green cloud with genetic algorithm. Um, GPG performance and power estimation using machine learning. Uh, coordinated management. So, any hey, IPEC. Is that guy here? <laughs> Should be. He's, he's involved in a lot of this stuff. You go talk to him. Um, <coughs> Multiple connecting resources in a chip multiprocessor and machine learning approach. So this is my book 2008. Uh, this stuff goes way back. Uh, people have been doing this uh, for a long time. There's this cool paper, A Parallel Genetic Algorithm for Multi-Objective Microprocessor Design. That's in 1995, where they were using genetic algorithm uh, to try to basically design big parts of a microprocessor. They're proposing doing this uh, back in 95, back before I was born. Uh, Imran Gloy, this is an awesome paper. Uh, this is a beautiful paper. You should go read it. A language for describing predictors and its application to automatic synthesis. So they come up with a very expressive language for describing branch predictors. And then they use genetic programming to construct a program in that language, or a, 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 a sentence in that language, if you like, that describes a branch predictor. And the fitness function is this prediction rate, uh, where lower is better. And so they come up with really interesting branch predictors that go way beyond uh, the, the, the taxonomy of branch prediction at the time, um, the Yale Pat uh, taxonomy of, of uh, two levels after branch prediction. Uh, these branch predictors that have branch predictors within branch predictors, these very complicated things, some of which you might want to build and some of which you might never want to build, but giving you ideas about how to build better branch predictors. Back in 95, <coughs> the Adams was a real inspiration for me when I read this paper. And it was also uh, part of my side because when we, pres we, we uh, proposed the perceptron predictor idea, they say, I didn't Joel Emmer already do that? It's, it's, you know, this was a, at the time, genetic algorithms and neural networks, well, that was the same thing. Uh, it wasn't the same thing. You guys know it's not the same thing. Uh, then uh, Tina Gomez, Doug Berger, and Mr. Michelena had this cool paper on neural evolution method for dynamic resource allocation on a chip multiprocessor. That was in the IJCN. That's the International Joint Conference on Neural Networks. That's the, uh, it's the machine learning conference back in 2001, where they uh, did this resource allocated cache partitioning uh, on a chip multiprocessor using neural networks. Neuroevolution, you know what that is? This is where you use a genetic algorithm to set the weights for the neural network. Uh, I'm sure I've forgotten some people. I'm almost, I, I definitely have forgotten some people whose papers I've read and enjoyed and, and, and forgot to put on, on the slide. The compiler guys are in all into this stuff too. We should be talking, the architects should be talking to them and getting ideas because there's, there's, especially like ASPOS is a great place to find this stuff. Um, 
So learning to schedule straight line code, MIPS 1997. You know the conference MIPS? You know the conference. This is a, a, a top neural network conference. And these compiler guys uh, went there and presented this paper on teaching, uh, teaching a neural network to do uh, code schedule within a basic block. Uh, then John Cavazos and, and Elliot Moss came up with inducing heuristics to decide whether to schedule PL, uh, PLDI paper uh, for uh, predicting whether it's a good idea to schedule, whether it's profitable to schedule. Uh, using machine learning to focus iterative optimization, uh, code completion with statistical language models. So this is, this is uh, helpful to programs, so, so a, a software engineering uh, kind of paper. Um, and then this one paper represents a ton of other papers uh, uh, in the security field, deep learning in Android malware detection. So teaching the malware to, to detect malware. You know malware is very sophisticated these days. It doesn't have signatures, it has behaviors, right? It, 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 it changes itself. And so can you use a neural network to, to uh, detect malware that is trying not to be detected? So, there, and one thing that just occurred to me, um, so we, we talk about machine learning, and a lot of times we, we, we put it in a little bubble, and, and there's other things outside that we don't consider machine learning, but there's statistical methods. Uh, there's, there's, there's things that we don't actually <coughs> consider machine learning because they maybe have a more well-developed theory behind them. Uh, and uh, we should talk, be talking to those people, too. Uh, do you remember SimPoint, the SimPoint paper? Okay, so that, I, I would consider that machine learning. So it's doing clustering or finding phases in programs. That, that's like an awesome, I think, of the uh, Test of Time Award at ASPLOS last year. Really good paper. Go read it. It's uh, Tim Sherwood and others, uh, SimPoint. It gave rise to a lot of new ideas. It was a, it's a methodology paper for, for a simulation, but it gave rise to a lot of ideas, including ideas on how to do phase prediction and other things. I, I, I'm reviewing papers from Michael that talked about some of them. Okay, so I've done a lot of talking and filled up as much time as I can. So what should we do next? Problems in systems research often generate lots of data. What do you think of this? Big data is a big thing. You get funding for big data. Aren't we doing big data, right? I, I branch prediction. I, I have a billion, billions and billions of branches, billions of training pairs. That's big data. I've got you know terabytes of traces on my hard drive. That's big data. Let's sell this as big data. Uh, can we do that? Raise your hand if you think we should sell this as big data. Get lots of grants. Try to get some interaction. Um, so this is great. So systems with worry about performance. Uh, reliability, whatever, something running for a long time, it's great for machine learning because you have all this data that you can use in feedback if you can figure out how to do it. Sometimes it's too cumbersome. Use sampling. Do something offline if you can. Uh, many students are interested in machine learning, right? Well, in our admissions process at Texas A&M, everybody wants to work with machine learning. We have these assistant professors we've hired in, in, our, in artificial intelligence and neural networks and stuff, and they're just, they're going crazy because they have all these students that want to work with them. Uh, well, how about we work together with the machine learning people and have the students uh, work on a project where the data is coming from systems and then uh, something happens and then now the student is a computer architecture student that's applying machine learning and now they're, now they're learning Thomas Sewell's algorithm for some reason and then they, uh, they get into it and they started off with machine learning and now they convert it to architecture so it's, it's a good opportunity for us to, to get more people. Um, also a good opportunity to lose people. I had a, a student that came in, a uh, PhD student, uh, wanted to work with me, and he loved machine learning. He totally loves machine learning. He's really, really good at genetic algorithms and neural networks. Uh, he's really good at the neural networks, and he didn't like Gen 5. So uh, now, he's, he's, now he's working for just a kind of pure machine learning group. Uh, how would you apply machine learning to, to, to equipment systems? And before I begin the questions or discussion, I also have to shout out to Cliff Young, who's in the audience. Um, paper, uh, I guess maybe 96, on near optimal intraprocedural intra branch alignment. That was an awesome inspiration to me. And I, I love I your work. He's a brilliant guy who's going to give the next uh, keynote with the much better. Um, okay, so questions?